The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great in mercy. The Lord upholds all who fall, and he raises up all who are bowed down. The Lord is near to all who call upon him. The Lord preserves all who love him. With these selected verses from Psalm 145, I invite all who are listening to this podcast from the Potter's True Methodist Church into a time of worship of the wonderful God who loves you, who longs to lift you up, and who promises that he is near you when you need him. My name is Edward Brown, and I am one of John Wesley's ministers here in Central South Africa. Let us pray. Praise to the name of the Lord God, creator of heaven and earth, and to the eternal Son, and to the Holy Spirit who proceeds from the Father and the Son. All praise to you, O Lord God, as you sit in the glory of your throne room, surrounded by the four strange living creatures who sing your praises eternally, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And as they break from that worship, the 24 elders pick up their worship and call out, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your power they exist and were created. And yet even as you receive that praise, your presence fills the universe and touches the very places where your people are meeting at this moment. You are present in the vast cathedrals, some built centuries ago to declare your grandeur, and where large choirs are gathering to sing to you. You are present in the small rooms, where people whisper as they meet in secret in those countries where even the mention of your person brings persecution and punishment. And you are present with us as we share in this time together. And we worship you and declare that we honour you and love you. Beloved Father, Son and Holy Spirit, accept our worship and meet with us and touch us at those points in our hearts, spirits and lives where there is pain and brokenness. Grant us newness and wholeness. For we ask this not because we deserve such blessings, but because it is your nature to show mercy and compassion to all who call upon your name. And in declaration of being your people, we join in the prayer that will be prayed by your people in every language around the world today. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Our hymn for today is George William Condor's All Things Praise Thee, Lord Most High, and is hymn number 29 in the Methodist hymnal. All things praise thee, Lord Most High, heaven and earth and sea and sky. All were for thy glory made, that thy greatness thus displayed should all worship bring to thee. All things praise thee, Lord, may we. All things praise thee. Night to night sings in silent hymns of light. All things praise thee. Day to day chants thy power in burning ray. Time and space are praising thee. All things praise thee. Lord, may we. All things praise thee round her zones. Earth with her ten thousand tones rolls a ceaseless choral strain, roaring wind and deep-voiced main, rustling leaf and humming bee. All things praise thee, Lord, may we. 
all things praise thee, high and low, rain and dew and seven-hued bow, crimson sunset, fleecy cloud, rippling stream and tempest loud, summer, winter, all to thee, glory render, Lord, may we. All things praise thee, gracious Lord, great creator, powerful word, omnipresent spirit, now at thy feet we humbly bow. Lift our hearts in praise to thee, all things praise thee, Lord, may we. In continuing the theme of relating to the person and works of God's Holy Spirit, which we have been following over the last few weeks, this message will examine the problem of sinning against God's Holy Spirit. And the lesson for today is taken from Matthew chapter 12, and we read from verse 22. The people brought to Jesus a demon-possessed man who was blind and dumb, and Jesus healed him so that he could both talk and see. All the people were astonished and said, Could this be the son of David? When the Pharisees heard this, they said, It is only by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons. Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined. And every city or stronghold divided against itself will not stand. If Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then can his kingdom stand? And if I drive out demons by Beelzebub, who do your people drive them out? So then, they will be your judges. But if I drive out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or again, how can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man? Then he can rob his house. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. And so I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, But the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. May God bless the Scripture to our understanding. Amen. Many years ago I met a man who told me that he had grown up as the son of a Pentecostal pastor. Like many preacher's kids, he had rebelled as a teen and drifted away from the Christian faith. Along that lost road, he had been drawn into the occult. He told me that he had committed all kinds of sins and perversions on his way to becoming a satanic priest. He then had another encounter with the living Lord Jesus and had been saved from that life. And now he served the Christ. What was interesting about his testimony was that he said that he believed that the only reason he had been able to be saved was because he had never committed the sin of blaspheming the Holy Spirit, a sin which he said his Pentecostal preacher dad had declared could never be forgiven. Now let me say that I had no way of determining whether he had been telling me the truth or feeding me a line, but what I did know was that if his tale of his involvement in the occult was true, then he'd almost certainly been guilty of sinning against the Holy Spirit, because to have progressed within that dark world, he would have had to have cursed the Heavenly Father, 
or denied the Lord Jesus Christ at some point, or in some other way have debased the name or person of the Holy God. And a sin against one member of the Trinity is a sin against the whole of God. Having said this, let us examine what the Scriptures want us to know about sinning against God. And a good point to start would be with the sin that this man claimed not to have committed, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. In the Matthew 12 passage, the Lord Jesus declared that blasphemy against the Holy Spirit was an unforgivable sin. The word blaspheme means to speak reproachfully against, to revile or to rail against. In that encounter between the Lord and the Jewish authorities, the leaders credited the source of Jesus' power to cast out demons as having come from the devil. Miracles that had been performed by God working through Christ Jesus and should have been vessels to glorify the name of the Heavenly Father had been passed off as works of the evil one. God's glory was desecrated by being given to the devil. What this meant was that the Holy Spirit, by whose power the Lord Jesus Christ had acted, was declared to be evil. To declare the Holy God to be evil in any way is indeed the most terrible of sins, because the first and primary characteristic of God is His holiness. The sin of blaspheming the Holy Spirit cannot be committed by a Christian, but only by a non-believer. Only someone who ridicules God's power by denying that God can still perform His wonders and ascribes manifestations of His power to chance, or as the Pharisees did to diabolic involvement, can commit the sin. Although the sin against the Holy Spirit is the one that comes first to mind, it is not the only sin that the Bible teaches that can be committed against God's Spirit. Another sin that the non-believer can commit is resisting the Holy Spirit. The reference to this sin is found in Acts chapter 7, verse 51, where the deacon Stephen was preaching to the Jewish leaders just minutes before they murdered him. He told them plainly, You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit, as your fathers did, so do you. He then went on to remind them how their ancestors had persecuted the prophets and disobeyed the law. That pushed them over the edge, and so they stoned him to death. That's in verse 58 of chapter 7. The sin of resisting the Holy Spirit means that the listener deliberately decides to reject the message of God's love, grace, and salvation as offered through the death of the Son of God, the Lord Jesus, on the cross. When the Lord Jesus is dismissed in that way, the person is immediately guilty of rejecting the Heavenly Father who sent him. In Luke chapter 12, Jesus said that the people would be judged by the words that he had spoken when they rejected his call to receive him. Very emphatically, the Lord declared, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's in John 14, verse 6. This sin is obviously one that can be forgiven if a person who first resists the message of salvation later comes to repentance. We must note, however, that if resistance continues, that person will come under condemnation. For to reject Jesus is to reject God. And to reject God is to end up in the place where God is not. It will be a place of misery, eternal loneliness, and absolute destitution. The Bible calls it hell. In addition to the sins just noted, there are three other sins that Christians can be guilty of committing. The first of these is lying to the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 5 from verse 1, there is the story of a married couple, Ananias and his wife Sapphira, who lied to God's Holy Spirit. They owned a piece of land and sold it. They then donated a portion of the money to the work of the church. This was a generous action and commendable. But then they wanted to appear to be more generous in spirit than they were. 
And so they told everyone that they had donated all the profits from the sale to the church. This was a sin of pride because they wanted to be seen as being more spiritual than they actually were. By lying to the disciples in the church, they were lying to God, and God will not tolerate lies. God then struck them dead. Note that Peter did not have either the authority or the power to put them to death. That power and authority rests with God alone. All Peter did was pass on God's judgment in the matter. The warning to Christians is clear. Let us never be guilty of exaggerating to others about the level and depth of our commitment to God. God views that as lying. And although he probably won't strike us down, it would be better not to test him on that issue, just in case. In 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 19, Paul writes about the next sin, where he warns the church not to be guilty of quenching the spirit. Some versions of the Bible say, do not put out the flame of the Holy Spirit. Or similar wording. The Greek word, spenuti, means extinguish, as to put out a fire. Paul was telling the church not to put out the fire of the Holy Spirit within their meetings. In fact, the tense that he used was not unlike shouting, Hey, you there, stop doing that! To someone caught in the act of pouring water onto a fire. Now, most Christians have probably never deliberately decided to extinguish God's spirit flame in their lives. Because we all want to burn for Jesus. But sadly, it does happen. So let's look at how this can happen so that we don't do it. Quenching the Holy Spirit is almost always the result of secret unconfessed sin. You see, sin and holiness are exact opposites. Where there is some secret sin in a person's life, God's Spirit will not abide. Think of it this way. Darkness and light cannot exist side by side. What we all must do is regularly assess our hearts to see if there is something unholy in them and then confess that sin so that God can deal with it. And remember, God already knows, which is why His Holy Spirit's flame is burning low in our life anyway. That is, if it has not already been extinguished completely. When we catch sin in time and confess it, God is able to flame once more again in our life. And we can again burn brightly for him. The final sin against God that can be committed by a Christian is to grieve the Holy Spirit. Paul mentioned this sin in Ephesians chapter 4 from verse 30 to 32, where he wrote, Do not make the Holy Spirit sad, for the Spirit is God's mark of ownership upon you. A guarantee the day will come when God will set you free. Get rid of all bitterness passion and anger. No more shouting or insults. No more hateful feelings of any sort. Instead, be kind to one another and forgive one another as God has forgiven you through Christ. Such behavior and feelings indicate that God's Holy Spirit is not in control of the Christian's life. Let us not sadden the heart of our Heavenly Father by any of the above attitudes, for our Father longs to rejoice over us not to weep. Let us open our souls to God's Holy Spirit. Let us pray that His flame will burn in us, that we begin to produce the fruit of the Spirit which Paul described in the next part of his Ephesian letter as love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, and self-control. That's in Ephesians 5 from verse 22. As we produce such fruit, others will come in from the dark, and into the light of God's glorious love. Amen. I close the service with the blessing of St. Jude. Now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you without blemish before his presence of his glory with rejoicing, to the only God our Saviour through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen.